Over the years, Emile Beret has become one of our favorite car storytellers. He lives out the dream every day as a stunt driver and high performance driver for some of our favorite shows like The Grand Tour and Top Gear. And I really appreciate that he's come by to share so many stories. So today we have Emile's top 10 car stories. So I hope you enjoy those. I also hope that you've checked out Carly. They're our sponsor for this month on Venwiki, and their OBD device allows you more powerfully than ever to diagnose and clear the error codes that might be present in your car. They allow you to code special features and things into your car with their licenses for a specific vehicle or for everything. So be sure to check them out at the link in the description below. Use the code VINWIKI for a discount there and thank them for their support of the channel. Also, if you're shopping for a car, they can allow you to detect mileage fraud and other tampering, other things that you really want to know before rather than after you buy some car. So be sure to check them out at the link in the description below and thank them for their support of VINWIKI. If you tell me you're gonna get sick, I'll pull over. Short of that, I'm on it. So one of the neatest things that I get to do are what we call hot laps. So at the end of any, not any program, but most programs, a hot lap is when we take the participant who's been driving whatever car it is. If I'm working for BMW, it tends to be an M3 or an M5 or something. And we put them in the passenger seat and we show them what the car can do when it's being all that it can be. When you do hot laps, you turn all systems off, stability control off, traction control off, and it leads to some pretty neat stories. Firstly, the hot lap passenger varies widely, and they're all cool in their, in their own way. You get the fellow enthusiast that's like in love with cars as much as you are, and then it's like you're sharing this car with your buddy. You're like, watch what this can do, right? And it's, that's really fun. You get uh, the pessimist that's like, pro driver my ass, I can drive just as well. And that guy, you're like, all right, dude, hang on, because you're about to shit your pants. <laughs> You get that the knows nothing about cars passenger. That's just like the first time you go to the brakes, like the like you can. It's just like, oh my god, I had no idea. You get the kind that's easily aroused. I have some stories that I can't tell about some hot laps that turned out a different way. But I tell you, the companies I work for mostly are Ferrari, Aston Martin, BMW, Audi, and Tesla. But if the phone rings and it's a cool job, I mean, I'm, that's the beauty of being a contractor and not working for anybody uh, full time. I was lucky enough to work the launch of the Lexus LFA, which I probably would never have had an opportunity to drive. I, I since have not had an opportunity to drive that car, and that was an amazing program. And in this particular case, a few years ago, I got a call to drive the uh, work on the program for the Acura NSX, the new one, the, the hybrid. And it's a car that I'm re I was really curious about, and I didn't have high expectations. Honestly, I didn't think I would like it, and I wanted to do it. The bummer was it was 30 days in Ohio. Nothing against you folks that live in Ohio, but... I live in San Diego, I'm from Puerto Rico. I don't like cold weather. And this was March, April in Ohio, a month, 30 days in, within March and April there. At what was Honda's TRC, Transportation Research Center, that I think now is owned by some private company. Anyhow, the program were basically giving hot laps for 30 days. There was some training modules along the way. There was a, a part where we ride in the right seat while sales folks and service folks get to drive the car. But at the end of the day, hot laps, which is why you take these programs is we live for the end of the day, the hot laps. The folks were giving hot laps to, again, sales folks, service folks. And there had been a, a lady throughout the day that was in our in the various classes we taught who was, a, if I remember correctly, she was a service manager, really buttoned up, very professional, the epitome of a service manager, right? And she came out for the hot lap and, and we had talked a little bit between a couple of the modules or the classes. And so she saw me and she came over and got in my car because the participants can generally jump in any other cars. And I think we had six NSXs, six pro drivers giving laps around the track where the car was developed, which was really cool. The car worked amazingly well around there. Some guys have a preference to give a fast lap, which is a proper tidy lap, which is awesome and a great experience for folks. I always, I used to always ask folks, do you want a fast lap or a fun lap? And that kind of piqued people's interest. Like, what do you mean? What's the difference? And I'm like, about seven seconds. We're going to go slower in a fun lap, but where you're going to be looking out the side window going sideways. And so I was giving sort of drift laps in the NSX, which I got in trouble for because I was using more tires than some of the other guys. But this lady jumped in the car with me. We said, you know, hey, you ready to go? Let's do this. She buckled up. We're wearing helmets and we take off. And I go into the first turn. It was like this trail break at the car going sideways at about 70 miles an hour. And she starts, she gets like this case of Tourette's and, it, and she got, she was saying, shit, damn fuck. Shit, damn fuck. And I just remember thinking, what's coming out of this lady's mouth? So first she's like, she starts hyperventilating. She's like reminding herself to breathe. And I'm laughing thinking she's kind of putting me on, but she was freaking out. And at one point she said, 
I'm just, I, I go, are you okay? She goes, yeah, I'm just reminding myself to breathe. And I'm like, listen, if you need me to slow down a little or a lot, just let me know. And she was, she had the death grip and I was kind of worried, but dude, I'm giving a hot lap. I'm not backing off for anything. If you tell me you're going to get sick, I'll pull over. Short of that, I'm on it. You're in, you're in my, in my world now. Halfway around like the second lap, it, she just got this shit down, fuck, shit down, fuck, shit down, fuck. And that's all she kept saying. And it was amazing to me that this lady was like, this personality came out of her that was just insane so as we pull in and then they got to keep a video so once they left we, they got a video of their their driving and then the hot lap as well so when she left i you know looked at the camera i was like oh, you don't be mad at her you know your friends don't be mad at her she you know she couldn't help herself she's like yeah 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 and it was awesome we high-fived and she went off but at the end of that day we had a little debrief and the guy in charge said, oh, by the way, I want to show you guys a video. And this is the kind of enthusiasm we want to get from these clients. And, you know, make sure that you're talking to them while you give the lap. And they played the video. And we were all just rolling, laughing. It was awesome. Another good one was um, every year at Daytona, I'm lucky enough that Audi continues to call me to come up there. The idea is Audi invites VIPs to the 24 hours of Daytona. And they want these people that are going to watch. Some of them obviously know the, the car world and the racing world. But some are new to it, uh, investment partners with Audi or whomever it might be. And so they want to show them as much of the experience as possible. So we have a group of people that give them a pit tour and explain, you know, tire strategy. And this is what you're going to see during the night when you're watching the race and what have you. And then as part of it, they bring them out to us and we give them the IMSA program allocates about an hour to an hour and a half a day from Thursday, Friday and Saturday before the start of the race to the hot lap program. And we get to give them hot laps. Typically we do that in an Audi R8 or um, we've done it in RS7s four door with four people in it, no helmets, 178 miles an hour down the back straight before the bus stop. Insane that they let us do that without helmets. And this particular year we had Audi RS fives and a friend of mine who was in charge of Audi experiential marketing walks up with her entourage and she walks to my car, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, chief of Audi motorsport worldwide, right? The guy that you've seen in truth in 24, like, the the stoic german that runs audi motorsport and dictates what racing drivers have a career and which ones you know their career ends and so i i have to admit i'm like i see him and i'm like i'm a little nervous and so this girl knowing me like brings him to me and she's like all right and give him a good lap so he gets in and his hand one of his handlers gets in the back seat and he sits down looks over and he goes oh this is going to be a good lap and i'm thinking the German humor, you never know that German sense of humor, is it dry or whatever, but I, you know, the cockiness kicks in and I'm like, let me just say after this lap, you're going to promote me to the race team. And he looks at me and he goes, we'll see if you keep your job. And I remember going, uh, he's joking, right? To myself, I'm thinking he's joking, he's joking. So we take off uh, and we're doing the lap and those cars coming through the bus stop chicane typically like, again, I like to give somebody a fun lap and slide the car a bit. So I normally would turn into the bus stop chicane and just before I turned back to go up on the bank, I'd give it like exactly what you wouldn't want to do. I'd give the car a big lift and turn in and have the car slide sideways. So I had a friend of mine, Paul Charles Lee behind me in another RS5. And I'm thinking, you know what? It is Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, but fuck that guy. I'm just, I'm just going to do what I do, right? So I go in the bus stop and slide completely sideways through there and back up. And I kind of like glance over and he's not saying anything. So then we pull back into the pit lane and I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. What's going to happen here? And I go, so what do you think? Okay, lap. And he goes, I think you keep your job. And, and which I still don't know. Was that a compliment? Was that a, a diss? I don't know. But he got out of the car. He was happy. And I never saw Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich again. But Audi kept calling every year. I'm out there in Daytona. If you uh, happen to be in the 24 hours of Daytona, come find us. And uh, hopefully we can get a chance to give you a hot lap and go 100 and whatever mile an hour. We need to spread his ashes on the track at turn six. So the other neat thing that happened during Monterey Car Week, and I mean, to begin with, that is a special weekend for any car person if nothing happens, right? The fact that that happened with my father's car and this happened just made it that much more of an incredible weekend. And it shows you sort of what the car community and, the, and us people that are in the car world and that are so passionate about cars once we get together and we meet a few of our, of our kind, you know, and you think like, these are my people, how cool that those relationships can be. I'm up there, I'm working for Audi, doing the program at Laguna Seca morning and, and afternoon. I get a call from a, one of my classmates who I've talked about before on some of your videos, Franz von Holzhausen, uh, lead designer at Tesla, who's one of my best friends. And he calls and he goes, listen, I don't know how we're going to do this, but, um, and he asked me to do something. So now I'm back up now. So one of our classmates while I was at Art Center is a guy named Steve Anderson, car designer, 
super talented guy, ran a side business where he would do illustrations for supercar owners and Porsche owners and whatever. He had a lot of connections that seemed with Porsche people because he did a lot of Porsche illustrations, but Steve Anderson illustrations, look him up, amazing. So he and his wife, Carrie, were celebrating their, I want to say it was their 20th wedding anniversary, something like that, earlier in 2018 and uh, had hiked on Catalina Island, I think it was, were taking a ferry back. He didn't feel well, went down uh, to the bathroom and basically never came back up, had a heart attack and passed away. Super good guy, five children, a beautiful family. I didn't know the family very well until after the fact, I, I'm sorry to say, but um, have now hung out a little bit with his oldest son and some of the kids and what a tragedy to happen to such, I mean, it happens to anybody, but such great people. Um, so Franz called and said, look, uh, Steve's dying wish was to have his ashes spread at turn six at Laguna Seca. And there's a reason for this. So while I was at Art Center, it was in the early, early 90s, we would go up to the Monterey weekend at Laguna Seca and we would all camp at turn six. And it never dawned on me that I thought we just got up there. Somebody must have in our party got up there early enough to secure turn six, right? The campground up there. It turns out the scramp, the, the body that controls Laguna Seca Raceway, um, has like a subscription kind of thing for campsites up there. You have to basically request it and, and get a permit to camp at any of their campsites. And then if I have the story right, uh, yearly you, you re-up to get your campsite the following year. Well, Steve and his family, again, if I remember correctly, over the years had acquired a lot of turn six at Laguna Seca and during our art center days managed to secure the whole hill because he would find out from his scramp official friends that uh, a particular campsite that people hadn't re-upped. And as soon as they they were negligent or they missed their final cutoff date, he'd sign up and he'd get it. So basically that whole turn six during Monterey Car Week is a bunch of art center grads for the most part, maybe not every single corner of it. But so we'd go up there and we'd camp and it was always like a boy's trip. Like not, no girls allowed kind of thing. No, not no girls, but no significant others because we had girl classmates that were uh, car designers. But I never knew that, that that was a Steve thing, that that's how that had happened, right? Turn six, but Franz proceeds to explain this to me. And he said his wife and his kids are coming up for the first time that weekend. And what had happened, Steve and Carrie, his wife were talking, you know, like we all do, like you probably do with your significant other as well about, oh, you'll die first. No, you'll die first. Well, what do you want to do when you pass away? And he had mentioned, I want to be cremated and ideally my ashes spread over turn six at Laguna Seca, presumably the campsite, because that's where they were, but how much cooler would it be to be on track? And so that was Franz's message. He's like, dude, I know you're working it. You got to work your magic, sweet talk, whomever you've got to. We need to spread his ashes on the track at turn six. So my weekend starts and I'm feeling out the scramp officials that are, you know, let us in and on and off the track. And, and I'm trying to figure out from the Audi folks, how am I going to get an R8? Because my thought is I want to get Carrie, his wife, in an R8. I want to go up there to turn six, maybe, I don't know, slide through turn six like an idiot, like I would do. Um, and do something and then spread his ashes maybe as we're sliding sideways or something. That's my idea. But obviously I can't just get on track because it's not my track. <laughs> Another thing happened that sort of facilitated this whole thing going down and Audi was launching a concept car, the PB18. First time they've launched a concept car at Laguna Seca, but it was at electric central's driving position, really cool concept. And Steve was part of the design team that worked on that car. All right. So I'm working for Audi. Audi's presenting this car. I'm there. I'm getting to hang out with a lot of the Audi people, some of which have become friends. Um, Emanuele Piero, five-time Le Mans winner, who is an amazing human being. I'm hanging out with him a bit and I start talking to the design team. I meet the designers. I had dinner with some of the, the designers and I, I kind of probed to get some Steve stories. And so I went to the Audi folks the next day and I'm like, hey guys, and I, I didn't say anything about him being a classmate of mine or I'm, he's an art center grad. I'm an art center grad or that I knew him. But I, I said, uh, as it turns out, one of the designers that worked on that concept car that just launched last night passed away. His wife and kids are here. The family's here. They would love to spread his ashes kind of around turn six. I'm not sure. Maybe at the end of the day, when our day is over, maybe we can get on track and make that happen. And Audi, as soon as it was a designer from the car that they just launched, they're all, all about it. Clear it with Scramp. Do what you can. So I went to the Scramp folks. I told them the full story, the real story. And the Scramp officials were like, as far as we're concerned, that he's one of ours. You're clear to go. So now I have an R8 and I've got the track. But emergency people have that track. Just don't, don't drive quickly on the track. I'm on a track in an R8, a car I know well, and I've got my buddy's ashes with his wife in the car. I'm a, so we did like a hot lap on the way to turn six, got to turn six and all of his classmates, a lot of my classmates, a lot of people from Art Center are up on the hill. The hill is full of people because at this point I had let everybody know we're going to try to do something. We're going to be able to do something. And I can't tell you what a moment it was. We're driving through. I ripped through turn six. I did a U-turn on track, went counter race direction back to six. 
And um, I look to Carrie and I'm like, are you ready? And she looks at me like, what do you mean? And I'm like, we're getting out and we're spreading his ashes right here. And she just started tearing up like, you're kidding. I'm like, we're here, this is happening. So we get out, everyone's cheering on the hill. She starts crying. She starts spreading his ashes around. I'm, I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in that entire place. We spread his ashes, we jumped back in the RA, I revved the shit out of it, we tore out of there, and it was amazing. So then I get back, get off the track, I drive her back up to the hill, I get up there, and that's when you know I ran into some of my classmates and everybody's kind of telling Steve stories, and it was just amazing. Her kids, one by one, came up to me, and when, when it's a 23 or 24 year old, as old as, that comes up and, and speaks so eloquently about his father and thanks you profusely for doing this amazing thing for his mom, it's a 20 some year old college kid. It's like, wow, really bright human being, well-spoken, awesome. When a seven year old comes up and is thanking you for doing this for their family and what it means to them, it just moves you. And all of their, her, their kids at one point came to me to thank, to thank me for, it's like, it was an honor to be able to be in a position to even do that. But what an amazing moving thing. And we ended up, my buddy and I who were working the event, just ended up hanging out there and we had ordered pizza and we're cooking some hot dogs and drinking some beers. And we just hung out with them all night at turn six sharing stories. And it was just a neat way to bring people together that probably wouldn't have been brought together necessarily. And it felt like such an honor to be able to play a little part in this, a tribute to, you know, a car life led to the fullest, you know, it was just truly amazing. And it made an incredible weekend that much more incredible running into the guy who owns my dad's car. I didn't know that car was even existed being offered to drive it and then being able to do this for a classmate of mine, just a cool guy. And like I said, I, what a neat experience to be able to do that. Very cool. I got an email from my boss saying, Hey, don't panic. But when you get back, you don't have a job. We're shutting it down. And I started racing when I was eight years old. I raced all my life, turned pro when I was 13, racing ATVs, ATCs, three-wheelers, if anybody's old enough to remember those things before they got banned. My parents at some point said, listen, this racing thing may not work out. You need to go off and study something. And my entire life as a kid, like my earliest memories were drawing cars and in my head, pretending I was winning races all over the world. You know, how the, a kid's imagination. And so I drew cars my whole life. And so by the time my parents sit me down and have this conversation with me, I'm 16, 17, I could draw the hell out of a car. I was pretty good at drawing cars. And I had just read an article uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the automobile in 1986, US News and World Report. I don't even know if that magazine still exists. And there was a sidebar article in the magazine that had Jack Telnak, the then VP of design at Ford. Um, and he's standing there in this Hugo Boss looking suit with a concept car behind him and these concept car sketches. And I was like, oh, that's what I wanna do. Studied car design at Art Center, became a car designer, I graduated in the spring of 92. Um, was lucky enough to work for Mitsubishi uh, right out of school and, and super lucky that I had uh, the director of design there as a gentleman I had interned under when he was at Chrysler, and Chrysler Pacifica's Advanced Design Studios in Carlsbad, California. Loved me, was a, a fan of my racing and just my passion for cars. So he was a design director at Mitsubishi at the time. And I was really lucky in that some car designers will spend a career, their whole career at a car company or two car companies and never really get a design credit. And Roger Zremek, who, who was this gentleman, um, believed in me, pushed me a lot, got, kind of got me out of my comfort zone because I'm a 22-year-old kid out of school. My claim to fame while I was at Mitsubishi, I did the 97 Eclipse. So the 1997 Mitsubishi Eclipse is a car that I got a design credit for. And that was two years in into it, again, so super, super lucky. I also worked in the design world for Porsche. A lot of people don't know the Porsche Carrera GT was designed in Huntington Beach, California, not in Germany. I was there during the development of that car is all that I'm allowed to say about that. I did enjoy car design. The truth is I started to fall out of love with cars because it is like any other, uh, other business. It's political and you get pulled from here or there. Or you see some injustices, right? And this is like the, my whole purpose for living our cars. And I started to, to, to feel like it was affecting my relationship with cars. And, so, and, and the call to go racing was too much. I, I still had that passion. I was still racing while, while I was a car designer. And so I turned in my letter, letter of resignation and my parents said I was a dumbass for quitting the car design world, but I had to go back to racing. Um, the neat thing about that is that typically in the car design world, when you go to resign or, or leave for some other place, you're out that day. Security comes to your desk. They make sure you don't grab anything. I mean, the confidentiality paranoia that exists in these car design studios is crazy. I mean, the reality is if you sneak something out and get busted, you'll never work again. So it's not like I would do that. But my relationship was so good at Mitsubishi with the people I worked with, 
which is where I resigned from. So I did my two weeks like you typically would at a job. We had barbecues almost every afternoon to celebrate, you know, that I was going off to go racing. It was an amazing experience. I was really, really lucky to have landed there under that, that leadership, somebody that believed in me and, and pushed me along. I get out of the design world and I'm going to go off and go racing again. So I go to Jim Russell Racing School, which is where I had gone. I'd gone through their program. I had been invited back to the, a competition they have called the Graduate Runoffs at the end of the year where they take the top students from the top from the racing schools, invite them all out. This year it was 300 and some students. It was a week long process where they would eliminate guys all throughout the, the, the week. And I ended up winning that whole thing. So I got a, a year free racing in the Formula Russell series, Jim Russell Racing School series. And that's why I went back to Jim Russell, became a driving instructor. You also get to work ride and drive programs, we call them, for car companies. Example, Ford launches a new Mustang. They'll put together a tour with some pro drivers, some facilitators, product specialists, those kind of people. And we tour the nation, stopping in major metrop metropolitan areas typically. And all the local car dealers come out and we train the salespeople. This is how salespeople learn about the new product coming out. We have uh, some exercises where they get to drive the car. Some, we call them comp comp, competitive comparisons. The Mustang, we'd have them up against the Camaro and whatever else. So that you educate these guys and gals on selling the car. I was working a Chrysler program for the launch of the 300C. And one of the cars that we had in one of the modules was for the 300C SRT8. When that thing first came out, which is a beast of a car, really cool car. And in that tent, the person, the facilitator doing that, that talk had a CTSV and the 300C SRT8. And at the end of the day, we did a demonstration between those two cars. That person got sick, I think got laryngitis or something like that and couldn't do the module. The on-site coordinator, the OSC of the program, knew that I was a bit of a car geek, knew my background as a car designer, I was comfortable talking in front of people and came up to me and said, listen, we're in a jam, can you do his module? And this is a 45 minute module that you do eight times a day. And I was like, I mean, I don't, I don't know. He said, oh no, I know you can. This is a repeating pattern in my life, people putting, pushing me outside my comfort zone, but really making me better. It's one of those deals where you couldn't say no, I was volu voluntold to do this. So I went to my hotel that night and I studied up his module and, and did it the first day. It was a little rusty, a little shaky, but I found that I really enjoyed it. I mean, I'm in there for 45 minutes talking about this new SRT8, a CTSV, which is an awesome car, the first gen car. Uh, part of the module was comparing the, the SRT8 to an M5, which is a bit of a reach, I know, but I'm just a car guy talking to a bunch of other car guys. So it was really cool. I enjoyed it. The onsite coordinator was like, you're a natural. This is what you should be doing. The bummer is when you're on one of those programs and you're a facilitator doing a class, you're not out there driving on track, right? So for me in that particular program, they still let me do the hot laps at the end. At the end of those programs, typically we put all the salespeople in cars and we give them hot laps around the track. So I still got to do that. But the beauty of being a facilitator is that it pays a lot better than being a pro driver. So I kind of found myself this niche. One of the, the agencies that puts that program together for Chrysler in this case, got the contract to do Audi work. And so I started doing some Audi programs. They offered me a position to be the first chief instructor of the Audi sports car experience in Sonoma, California, back in 2007 with this car that had just come out called the Audi R8, which is a car that's near and dear to my heart. In doing some of that work, I met other people along the way. I met a gentleman, Paul Fanner. He's the guy that started Racer Magazine and a really influential figure in my life as well. And he had this idea to do an internet TV show on cars, which I know today that's like the normal thing, right? We were the first to do this in 2008 on cars. Um, and he said, well, you're going to be the host. We're going to do design reviews using your design background. We're going to do performance reviews using your racing background. This is like a dream job. It sounded like a dream job. I took it. It lasted two years. Our financial partner was Jay Penske, Roger Penske's youngest son. For two years, it was a dream job. I mean, I worked my ass off. I, I wrote every script. I took it super seriously. I mean, I really got into it and, and I worked super long hours, but it never, ever felt like work. Never felt like work. I would pick up a brand new car from a manufacturer on Friday or it would get delivered to our offices. I would drive it over the weekend and start kind of formulating my thoughts and, and creating a loose script. Monday, we'd put the car in the studio and, and do all the beauty shots inside a studio. Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, or any two of those days, we'd take it out to a racetrack somewhere. And I'd slide the shit out of it while I'm talking about it, which was just amazingly cool. Thursday, we'd shoot the car some more, and Friday, they'd pick it up, and I'd get a new something else, a new Fandango from somebody else. It was amazing. This is kind of the neat thing about that job, too. When we had some slow periods, I could still go back and do programs for, for Audi or Ferrari or whomever else I had been working for in the past. And I was down in South America doing a program for Audi, and I got an email from my boss saying, hey, don't panic, but when you get back, you don't have a job, we're shutting it down. And I'm like, how do you not panic when you get that email, right? I was like looking at it going, what? 
even that, the fact that the on cars thing happened and for two years I was on camera design and, and road test editor led me to other things. I almost became one of the hosts of a show based on a show uh, about three English guys talking about cars. You guys know what I'm talking about. I got right down to, I was one of the last candidates and didn't get it. It was the U.S. version of the show, the, the second generation of the U.S. version of the show. And as much as I know it sounds like sour grapes, having watched it last year, I'm kind of glad I didn't get it because it just, I, I, I couldn't be part of a bad car product. It would still would have been amazing to be on TV doing car stuff because I'm sure it's going to lead to other things for those guys, but it was pretty terrible. But that's led me to other things. So I'm currently putting together a sizzle reel or a, a mini pilot for a show called The Motorazzi um, and still kind of designing what that show is going to be. So I don't know, you might still see me on TV doing something car related. And that was all just because of this, these synergies and meeting people and and really just getting after it and doing the best job you can at what you're doing. And then people notice and it just leads to other things. So that's kind of how I ended up working with cars, playing with cars for a living. And I hesitate in saying this, because I don't want anybody to, to hear this. It's what I would do for free anyway. And the fact that they pay me to play with cars, it's like, done, sign me up. He just sees my face, he's on the phone and he just freezes. And now I'm really nervous, something's up. So I have a horror story to tell you, and I know a lot of folks have come in here and told you horror stories about dealerships, and I hate to talk badly about any particular dealership, but this was a nightmare for me, one of the, one of the most stressful moments of my life. Back in 2002, I was lucky enough to put my pennies together and order uh, an E46 M3. This is when the E46 had first come out, and a good buddy of mine had just bought one, and he had the SMG gearbox, which I was really intrigued by. I'm a manual guy, I would have ordered a manual, but my buddy Scott like kind of convinced me to order an SMG and I had driven his and I was intrigued by it. And what I loved about that gearbox and any single clutch electro hydraulic box is that as a driver, you're part of the equation. Yes, they're clunky. If you leave in the automatic mode, first of all, you're an idiot. Why would you buy that gearbox and not shift the paddles? And how hard is it to pull the damn paddle? So anybody that complains about the SMG gearbox or any F1 gearbox in Ferraris or even the Maserati Quattroporte back in the day, because it's clunky and automatic is an idiot. Never drive those things in automatic. Shift the damn paddles, right? I ordered the SMG. So here's the thing with the E46 M3. Yes, the E30 is the poster child for M cars, but if you drive it an E30 today, super lithe and nimble and it corners well, but no go, no power. Stock on those goofy little wheels, it just didn't, I don't know, it didn't hold up. But amazing car, look, it's the icon, right? And the racing successes, Enough said, E30 is the E30, the holy grail, I guess, of M cars. But the E36 that followed, way superior car, especially the Euro version. Amazing, big jump to the E36, six cylinder over four cylinder. Yes, it got a little heavier, but still super nimble car by today's standards, still lightweight. And of course it was the lightweight version. But then the jump from E36 to E46, I think was almost like a two generational jump. I liken it to the jump from F430 to 458. That was massive. That was almost like a three generation jump for Ferrari. But the thing to keep in mind, which we were talking about earlier, the E46 came out in a time when what we would consider supercars today were, obviously they were the, the pinnacle at the time, but they weren't quite supercars. Ferrari 360, Porsche 911 turbos, which have always been amazing. And, and the 360 itself, a pretty big jump for Ferrari from 355 to 360. Electro hydraulic gearbox. I mean, it was an amazing car, but the E46 M3, when it launched, wasn't that far off of those cars. What made the E46 so amazing to me is that it was a usable everyday car. The build quality had gone significantly up from the E36 as well. The materials inside, and when the door shut, it, there was just this German solidity that the Germans have that reputation, but had kind of started to lose it. That car had it. And it just felt like a lot of car, especially for the money. And the performance wise, it did, like I said, 80, 90%, 95% of what the supercars of the day did. So that's why that car, for those of us that have sort of had experience through E30, E36, E46, E90, E92, if we're talking about the coupe and even F80, the current car that's now going away, that car is kind of the, the sweet spot. I was a little nervous because I kind of couldn't really afford this car. I was definitely gonna be car poor, but I just could, right? Not the most responsible decision uh, to make. Order the car, it arrives, and I'm like a kid before, 
uh, Christmas uh, that morning when I drive up to get the car. And I bought it at a dealership that was about an hour from my home, even though there were three dealerships closer to me because my friend Scott that I mentioned earlier had bought his previous BMWs from this dealership. His family had purchased lots of cars from them. They were a known quantity and, and friends of my friends. So no problem. And they, they gave me the car at sticker, which at the time you could get, but it, it, you'd have to work a little bit to get it. Show up to pick up my car. And I remember as I'm signing the papers and I, they give me the keys and I'm in it. I remember pulling out of the dealership on PCH there in Newport Beach thinking, at some point they're gonna stop me. They can't give me, I can't, I have this car. I was blown away by the car. I think it took me that weekend to put the 1200 miles on it for the break-in because you can't, you couldn't go full throttle, couldn't go over hundred miles an hour, a bunch of stuff you can't do in those cars. And the break-in procedure was pretty critical. We would later find out it was really critical because I had to rebuild all the bottom ends on those cars. But I followed it to a T and I called the dealership. I'm like, okay, I'm ready for my 1200 mile break-in because after the 1200 mile break-in, all bets are off, you can hammer down. So I, I remember I called him and it was, I, I exaggerated. It was, probably took me that week because I remember I took the car on a Friday for the 1200 mile inspection, drove the hour out of my way to take it in. And my plan was to wait for the car. And I'm super OCD, you know that about me. I write down, I stop, I write down the mileage on the car. Before I would ever take my car to the dealership, I'd make sure it was washed because the dealership would wash it for you, but they're never gonna wash your car the way we wash our cars. So the car was clean and I'd tell them every time, no need to wash it, it's fine. And I even I remember asking them and I knew the answer because it's that, that 1200 mile inspection is an oil change, a differential change, which is kind of the key and a couple of their little items. And I said, do, do you guys need to drive the car? And he said, no. I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm going to wait for the car. And he's like, well, we're really busy. And he's like, I'm going to need it over the weekend. I'm thinking, no, over the weekend, you're freaking nuts. And then he goes, well, we've got the, the new seven series. I can put you in a seven series for the weekend. And as a car guy, I'll, I want to drive the new seven series. So I reluctantly agreed. I took the seven series home for the weekend, thoroughly enjoyed that. Come Monday, as soon as the dealership's open, 7.30, service department, I'm calling. I'm like, hey, I'm ready to pick my car up. And Scott gets on and goes, well, Emil, we were a little bit busier than we thought. We didn't get to your car. Give me till tomorrow. And now I'm like, mm, I want my car. 1,200 mile break and done so I can hammer down on the thing. But what am I going to do? So now I'm waiting until Tuesday. In the back of my mind, a little doubt started creeping in. Like, what's going on here? Tuesday, 7.30. Boom. Well, we might need the car for another day. I'm like, what's up with my car? And he finally tells me, he goes, well, one of the mechanics put a little scratch on the front fender, just a little itty bitty scratch. We're fixing it. I'm going to show you where it is when you come up and see the car. And then, you know, if you're not happy with it, we'll, we'll figure out how to get you happy with it. And now my blood pressure is going up and I'm getting really nervous, but what am I going to do? I, I kind of have to agree. Right. And then as I hang up the phone, I'm like something, it's like to trust your instincts, right? Something isn't quite right. And so I get in the seven series and I start driving to the dealership and I'm about 15 minutes away and I call him and I said, hey, by the way, I'm heading up. I'll see you in about an hour. And he starts hemming and hawing and now I know something's up. And I'm very close now, but now I'm getting on the gas even more so. And I show up to the dealership, not an hour later as he expected, and he turns into a goat. He's white. He just sees my face, he's on the phone and he just freezes. And now I'm really nervous, something's up. Again, I can barely afford this car. This is my baby. So I walk up to him, he hangs up the phone and I'm like, I'm here to see, I need to see my car. I, I need to see my car now. And he goes, um, okay, give me a second. Let me make a call. He makes a call, he hangs up and now he's weirdly, he's kind of calmed down. He goes, all right, where, where's the seven series? And I go right there and he goes, well, let's jump in it. And I'm like, I need, I just want to see my car. And he goes, yeah, it's not, it's off site. Throw him the keys. We get in the car. We drive off site to their body shop, essentially. Okay. Now I'll paint this picture come up the driveway and it's like chain link fence because they don't care how the body shop looks, right? There's cars everywhere. And as we pull in to the right, I see a steel gray E46 M3, but it's covered in plastic and clearly has been thoroughly repainted. So not my car as far as I'm concerned. I'm looking to the left, we park, he gets out, I get out and I'm trying to find my car as the owner of the body shop or the guy that runs the body shops walks out and he's, he's the typical like mustached, greasy body shop owner guy, right? And he walks up and he goes, oh, your car's over here. And he points at the car that I saw on the way in that I know isn't my car. And so he starts walking towards the car and I'm, I turn, I start walking behind him going like, no freaking, this is not my car, right? And as we get to the car, I realize the entire body side of the car has been repainted. Not like the front fender and a scratch has been touched up. Not only has it been repainted, they, they painted the car in the wrong color gray because it's faded in past the door into the rear fender and it doesn't match. Forget that the texture doesn't match, the orange peel on it. It's a different color. And as I'm looking at it, the guys, I hear the guy talking to me and I'm just, I'm seeing red. Like the red mist is, it's on, right? I'm looking at the black shadow, black trim, 
overspray, clear on it. I'm just telling you the story right now, I'm getting a little worked up, right? And this guy's talking to me. I finally turn the guy, I'm like, will you shut the, you know what up? I don't know what you did to that car. That is no longer my car. And I took turn to the, the service managers and I'm like, get me back to the dealership right now. And the other guy keeps yapping at me. And I, I don't know how I didn't fly out the handle and deck him. Now, I know not to do that, but I am so fired up now. A former me would have knocked the guy, the you know what out. Get back in the BMW, back to the dealership. On the way back, I call my friend, Scott, who was my connection to the dealership. And I said, you better get to BMW because I'm about to get arrested. And Scott just hangs up the phone. This is the kind of, he's like a brother for me. This is the kind of communication we have, right? But Scott was the president of Sparco USA at the time. And they're 20 minutes away from this dealership. So I'm going to get arrested. I'm beating someone's ass, right? Get to the dealership. The service manager hasn't even stopped the 7 Series and I'm out the door. And I make, and I'm... By the way, now I'm seeing myself from outside, outer body experience. I'm not in control. I am not in control. I make a beeline through the dealership to the GM of the dealership at the time, storm into his office full steam. And there's a couple in there, like their early 60s sitting in the chairs, chairs like this side by side. And I go right between them, hand on the desk, and I'm yelling over the desk and I'm finger in his face. Your effing dealership wrecked my effing car and you tried to effing lie to me about it. Nah. In a volume appropriate for a helipad. So the whole dealership has now stopped, right? Then I feel a hand on me and, and I go to turn around. I'm like, I am coiled and ready to attack. And I turn, it's my buddy Scott. And I'm like, thinking to myself, how did you possibly get here? It turns out he was down the street at a sandwich shop when I said, get to BMW because I'm about to get arrested. And he knows me, Puerto Rican hot blooded. So he dropped a sandwich and went to the dealership probably saved me from doing something really stupid. So anyway, he calms me down. The dealership is like, Emil, we're going to fix your car. And I kept on, that's not my car. That's your car. That's not my car. That's not my, we'll fix it for you. Dad. Not fixing it for me. You're fixing it for you. I want a new car. I want a new car. Scott calms me down. I leave. The most stressful three or four days of my life follow. I finally called a friend who's an attorney and I didn't really want to do that. But I, I'm thinking these guys are trying to screw me. Every time I would talk to them, they're think, they're, their message to me was like, we're going to fix it. We're going to make it right. We'll give you your car back. And I would remind them, not my car. I don't want that car. Because I'm the way we are about cars. That I, Who knows? Oh, by the way, they weren't supposed to drive the car. I pull out my mileage log. The car had been driven 17 miles. Not two miles, not seven miles, 17 miles. Someone was out hot dogging the hell out of that car. So this attorney friend finally says to me, okay, Emil, Firstly, you got to calm down. This is like five, six days later. And I'm still amped up. He goes, I want you to calm down, go back to the dealership, call, call and at, make an appointment to see in the GM, sit down with him and, and very calmly, as calmly as you can muster, say to him, here's what's going to happen today. I'm either going to order my brand new E46 M3, my next one, or I'm walking down the street to the Porsche dealership. I'm going to buy a brand new 911 and you guys are going to pay for it. And so I did that and the GM looked at me. I said, give me a moment, went upstairs to, I guess, upper management, whoever the heck happened to be upstairs, came back down with a sales guy uh, whose name I can't remember. He was amazing Australian guy. And he goes, Neil, this is your new sales guy, such and such. Go sit down with him and order your new M3. I just didn't think it was going to happen that smoothly and go that well. So it did. I went, the bummer of it was that my car was steel gray. Steel gray was discontinued. I, I ordered silver gray, sight unseen. It turns out the color was beautiful and I was very happy with it. Had to wait four months for the car. And so in the four months that it took to build my car and bring it to the US, I had a brand new seven series, all fuel paid for. Anytime that stopped the dealership, they would wash the car for me. And that seven series, I got all of it out of that car. All my friends drove it. One of my friends took it to Vegas with a bunch of his buddies. So it was cool to have that seven series. And it was also cool to get a new M3, even though it wasn't the color I originally wanted. I fell in love with the color, but let me tell you, what a stressful moment it was in my life. And I've had to go back and do it again. And even if I would have gotten that 911, I just as soon not have that experience because it was massively stressful. The last thing I want to do is talk to anyone, much less this lady on star who's calling an ambulance. I'm like, no, ma'am. Yes, I'm lucky to do what I do for a living, but sometimes it goes wrong. It was early on in our days at On Cars, General Motors lent us a Pontiac G8 GT, if you remember that thing, right? Cool car, Australian built, Holden essentially, four door V8 powered rear drive, awesome car. And um, we shot at a place called EVOC, Emergency Vehicle Operations Center out in San Bernardino where the police do a lot of training. They have like this little racetrack is a bit of a stretch, but a little track. And we ended up using it quite a lot to film because it was a controlled environment. We can do all kinds of silly things there. And this day we were doing some silly things because again, rear drive V8 sedan. 
And I'm sliding the thing right to the edge of the guardrail and I'm doing a lot of cool things and transitioning from one slide to another through this like little maze of like streets that they have. And it was an amazing shoot. It had all gone, gone super, super well. We're done doing the dynamic stuff. The director's like, all right, we're just going to do some car to car stuff, super basic stuff to wrap up and then we'll get out of here. My mistake that day was that we went straight from do doing the dynamic stuff to doing this car to car stuff and I hadn't shut the car off. You know as well as any of you watching, when you shut one of these cars off and you've had stability control and all the systems turned off, when you refire the car, it all defaults to the systems being on. I hadn't done that, so systems were still off. And the second mistake, the, the perfect storm, was that I knew that pressure stuff was done. And as cool as the job is, look, sometimes you're sliding a car close to an obstacle, there's pressure and you got to perform. And that's what we live for. It's cool. But that was done. And so I'd let my guard down. I was relaxed. I was chilled. I may have even had the radio on at a light volume while we're doing this because there's a lot of downtime or the director might say, okay, circle back around and come back. So I was, I basically just let my guard down. And now we start to use some of the parts of the track that we hadn't used during our, our slippy slidey stuff. Rick, the director's like, all right, Emil, I want you to do some slightly faster flybys. Just come on up and don't bother slowing. Come fly by the camera, the camera car. And on those, like I told you on the Ford GT story, you try to get as close as you can to the camera to make it look more dynamic, right? So I'm doing some of those and we get to this part of the track we haven't used. And it just, again, perfect storm. There's a slight rise in the track and right at the peak of the rise, the road dips off to the left, just a sweeping turn. And I'm coming up on that and I'm on the left side of the car. As I come up on left, pass on right. So I'm now passing on the outside of the corner on this hill with my guard down, probably 45, 50 miles an hour, but it's a relatively tight bend. So I come up over, I pass on the right, and as soon as I turn the wheel to pass the car, the camera car on the right, the car just goes into this big, lazy slide. Again, not big speed, but I was on ice. And it wasn't ice, it was like soot, like this film of sand from the desert and, and just whatever little tire bits, my, it just, this part of the track had never been used. And now I'm on the outside edge of the track. And I just remember the thing went into a slide. And as I turn into it, I'm just thinking, why is this thing going into a slide? And, and, and in the inst next instant fraction of a second, I realize it's because the systems are still off and I didn't turn them back on. And now earn your living, right? And I counter steer and I know what's coming because there's a guardrail right there. And I'm doing my best not to look there because if you look, there, you know, your eyes are your future. We always say in our racing schools that we teach. And I know not to look at that damn guardrail. So I'm looking where I want to go. I'm looking at my hopes and dreams, not at reality. But you know exactly what happened. That thing just this lazy slide just continued, continued. And I caught the edge of the guardrail with the back of the car, which spun the nose right into the front. And I just remember thinking, no way, Emil, you just did that as it's happening and come to a stop. And of course, GM car. So it calls OnStar and the lady of OnStar. I, the, the last thing I want to do is talk to anyone, much less this lady OnStar who's calling an ambulance. I'm like, no, ma'am, we're a film crew. We're filming the car. When I close racetrack, we have control. We have our ambulance here. And she doesn't want to hear that. She just wants to send me an ambulance. So I'm dealing with her. The director's coming up and he's just incredulous. Like, really, dude, it's the end of our, our day. And this is, and no one wants to sh kill me more than me. I'm looking for a top building I can jump off of. It was a bad, bad day. And look, the reality is if you do this enough and you push, not that I was pushing in that particular segment, but you're going to crash. I, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of guys, some famous racing drivers that have done some film work and a lot of film guys, some of which you guys would know, I know for a fact, we've all crashed stuff. It happens. You try not to talk about it. And this is the first time I publicly talked about it, but it happens. It's just part of the deal. But when it, at that moment, you just want to bury your head in the sand and you feel like it's like, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. So we got to call the press agent at Pontiac and tell her what happened. So the team did a quick job of putting a great job of putting together a quick edit of the film because it was awesome. And I, the GATT was a great car for the price and at the time. And so the review, the review was super positive. So we had sent her, as it turns out, probably not intelligently, sent her a preview of what the episode was going to look like. And it's just me linking everything, sliding the thing to within in, into the guardrail, right? Not thinking what she would think when she saw it. So my boss sits me down and goes, we're going to have this talk with her. You're going to bite your tongue, take it, you know, take your medicine. We'll move on. We'll be okay. Da, da, da. So we get on the phone with this lady and uh, she starts just railing into me. Like I've seen the video. I've seen what you were doing. Of course you were going to crash. You don't have any former chief instructor, Audi sports car experience. I mean, whatever. I, I've been doing this my whole life. I know what I'm doing. 
even though I seemed like I didn't when I crashed the car at relatively low speed. But she starts just telling me how I'm a journalist, which I don't know what I'm doing. Of course, I was going to crash because she saw what I was doing. Da da da. I should probably go to a driving school or a racing school. And I'm thinking that, and I'm looking at my boss and he's giving me the eye like, don't you dare. And I took it. I listened to it. I took it. I wrote her a nice email and apologized. But that was probably the worst of it. I felt like an ass to begin with. But this lady telling me how I didn't know the first thing about driving. Okay, but I wrecked her car. What am I going to do? I wrecked. So anyway, that was one of the worst days. Um, Not the only car I've ever crashed. Probably won't be the last one either. It was the last to now, but I just probably jinxed my ass. That was one of the worst days ever. One of the best days ever was working for a television program, Three British Guys Present. I'm not going to mention the name because I'll get in trouble probably. Working for those guys, it was a story on fast SUVs shot in uh, Area 27 in British Columbia, Canada. Beautiful racetrack, Area 27. If you have the opportunity, you must go. To prove that the SUVs suck, because that was their, their message, relative to a sedan, they had pro drivers do a lap in an M3. So we had four pro drivers working that day, myself, three other guys. You can imagine if on camera they show the proper fast lap, it looks boring. A proper lap, you're not sliding because that obviously costs time. So what they do is that they edit together a, a lap showing the fast, some of the driving in the fast lap, but with some sideways action. And so they asked for their main stunt driver who they flew in from England, a guy named Nikki, who is phenomenal, great guy uh, for a lot of reasons, which I'll get to in a minute. But they said, Nikki, do some laps, some exciting laps in the M3. So he goes out and this guy, he can drive anything and he can drive it sideways. Most of the footage you see of the cars sliding in the video when, when they're in England, it's usually him. So he goes out and does a lap, but for whatever reason, the director wasn't totally satisfied with those laps and then said, hey, let's put in the local guy, a guy named Stefan, who is, you know, former Indy Lights guy, m- multiple karting champion, awesome young up and coming driver. So he jumps in and he goes out. But again, the fact that he's an up and coming racing driver means that he's not as comfortable sliding the car. Can he do it? Yes, he can do it, but it's not his thing. His thing is the minute that thing starts to slide, you catch it because that's not good for your lap time. So he goes out and does some. Director's still not satisfied. He goes, hey, I have an idea. Let's throw Meal in the car. Meal, do some exciting laps. Now, full disclosure, which I didn't say then, I just took the credit. I had just come off of 11 days working a program called BMW M Track Days. In the M Track Days, it's two sessions per day, a morning and an afternoon session. Twice a day, we get to give hot laps at the end of each of the the segments, the morning session and the afternoon session. And the hot laps at BMW are drift laps. We're sideways and together. So I had come off of 11 days sliding the hell out of M3s. And here I am, they're asking me to do some slidey laps in an M3. So I go out there and slide around the one lap and the director's like, wow, that looked awesome. And then he challenges me. He's like, maybe next time you can ride the curbs a little bit. Like now he's telling me to kind of, you know, put it on the edge. So I had a moment where I, to make it look more exciting, I dipped a tire into the dirt and, and, and that one actually got a little lucky because I turned into the corner a little bit hot and you can hear in the video, I'm off throttle and I slide right to the edge of the road and I just dip a tire in the dirt. But the corner that they were filming, he asked me to ride the curb on. I just, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, right? Right up on the edge. And it was awesome. And he comes on the radio and he's like, okay, that looked dangerous. Go back to one. We're done. And it was awesome. But as I get back to where the guys are, the the other pro drivers, there's Nikki and he's clapping. And it's like, there's a lot of ego in this industry, I'll say, right? We're all, we have a certain personality, racing drivers, right? And so it's rare to find somebody that's humble enough and confident enough in, in their skills that they can celebrate somebody else's success. And sure enough, man, I got out of the car and gave me a big hug. He's like, dude, that was awesome, da-da. How cool that this guy, you know, could do that, right? The director, when I saw him a little bit later, he high fives me because, dude, that was cool, da da da, whatever. And so I, I, my peacock feathers are fully out. I'm walking around like I'm the man all that day. And the next day, we're together uh, in the morning, and the presenters have now shown up. And the tall presenter, the one that is never short of opinion, I'll say, he starts making a beeline over to where we are, the pro drivers. And he's got kind of a little smirk on his face. So I'm like, oh, let's see, what's this going to be about? And he walks right up to Nikki and goes, Nikki, I heard we found your replacement. And now I'm like, ah, that was awesome. Because it told me that the director probably went to him and said, hey, by the way, we had this really cool deal happen today and da-da-da. And Nikki high-fived him and high-fived me. And, you know, it, it was this whole kumbaya, lots of love. And it was, it was really cool. But it's one of those things. I had a good friend back in the day that said to me, he goes, you should aim to find yourself at the intersection between hard work, talent, and luck. And that's where I was that day. You know, I... I had been busting my ass working, um, trying to maximize the abilities that, that I may have. And I got the call and I was there. Talent, hard work, and luck. I was at that intersection. I put it down. Man, I was on cloud nine for a while with that. And the phone kept ringing to work with those guys. So I must have done something right.
I just remember hearing the biggest explosion of all time. You know, I used to host a show called On Cars doing car reviews. And the neat thing about On Cars is that every week I'd have a new car. It would be a car from a manufacturer. It would get dropped off on a Friday. I'd pick it up, I'd drive it over the weekend, kind of start to formulate my script, my thoughts, what I was gonna say about the car. We'd film it during the week. It would go into the studio at the end of the week and get all the beauty shots done. And then come next Friday, we drop it off and there'd be a new something or other that I'd get to go spend time with. So it was really a dream job. In this story, I was driving an A4, the new B8 A4 when that had just come out. Uh, when we were in the office, knowing the car was coming, we're trying to think of story ideas. Well, how can we present this car and make it exciting? And one of the producers came up with the idea to shoot it with an airplane. He followed the Red Bull Air Races Championship. And one of the pilots in that series was an Audi sponsored guy, he had Audi logos on the, on the airplane. And he's like, wouldn't it be cool if we had some shots of the airplane in the car? And that very quickly turned into some shots of the car driving with the airplane flying, which quickly turned into the car sliding and the airplane. And so I'm a huge aviation buff. My dad was a flight surgeon in the Navy. My little brother's a Navy pilot. I just grew up around air shows and airplanes and I love airplanes. Not quite as much as I love cars, but I love airplanes. We contact the gentleman. The gentleman is a guy named Mike Mangold, two-time Red Bull Air Races world champion, I think 05 and 07. At the time, the winningest Red Bull Air Races pilot, maybe still today, Air Force Academy graduate, F-4 Phantom, badass pilot, flew the F-4 Weasel as well, Wild Weasel, just a legend of a pilot. So we go out to an airport in the middle of nowhere in California, Apple Valley Airport, and we're shooting. And so I remember like, again, being an aviation buff, like we had a little brief before we went out and it was like the Blue Angels, dude. We're talking about like, okay, so I'm gonna be here and you're gonna be here. And I'm super geeking out about being with this badass and you know, we're choreographing what we're gonna do. And the director's like, ah, oh, can you do it? I'm like, yeah, I can do it. We were going to slide the car into frame so that camera is going to be aiming down a runway. I'm going to come down a taxiway. I'm going to do a big Scandinavian flick, throw the car into a slide and come into view with the car sliding as the pilot is in the air doing a tail drag, which is kind of like the tail sliding in the air behind me, which sounded amazing, right? And to get this A4 to, to you know, do the Scandi flick and slide into frame long enough that it's a cool shot, I'm doing 80, 85 miles an hour, big Scandi flick, and then coming into frame sideways. So I'm, camera's facing down the runway, I'm way the heck over here, and the airplane's somewhere in the sky. Action! Wah! I'm ripping on the gas, get to the speed, time the move, big Scandi flick into frame sideways. We do the first one, I'm happy with my slide, I have no idea where the airplane is. The director yells, cut! Emil, the timing was off! And I'm like, I mean, I went when he said action. Back to one, one where we start the, the scene, right? I drive back to my spot, stop. All right, guys, let's try to get the timing right. I'm thinking this is like a general statement, right? And he's like, yeah, we have the timing wrong. And he kept saying, we, we, we. I'm thinking, you got a mouse in your pocket? Because I'm not, I'm going when you tell me action, right? Action, bah, same thing. Bah, big Scandi flick, I'm hanging onto the thing, beautiful. Airplane was behind me like three, four seconds. Emil, the timing is not right. The director, a guy named Rick, awesome guy. We were like brothers, which is kind of why like we would have some contentious um, arguments that I, I would say some, some, some contentious heated battles uh, because we got along so well. He had a driving background. He awesome guy, love him to death, but we'd go at each, at each other sometimes. So he's yelling at me that I've got the timing wrong. So finally I pick up the radio. I'm like, Rick, I'm going when you say action. So adjust when you say action. I can't see the airplane. He's somewhere behind me. Do another one. We screw it up again. Separately, we do our, the right things, but it's not in sync. And finally, he goes, if I, I know I can do it, if I can do it, you should do it. I'm like, you son of a bitch. No, you didn't. So I pull up to him, throw the thing in park, and, and argument ensues. Meanwhile, Mike is circling in the airplane in a Red Bull Air Races, and Edge 540 was the airplane. So the gas tank is relatively small because it doesn't have to be in the air long. He's waiting on us to have this measuring contest that we're having about, do, can I do the scene or not? Finally, Rick just, you know, well, forget it. Let's just move on to the next thing. And now, by the way, stay in the car. So we moved to doing static shots. And so I'm parking the car relative to the camera wherever he wants it. And the first shot we did was a three quarter front shot. And instead of jumping out of the car and then next, when it's time to move it, getting back in the car and moving, he's like, just duck down. I'm like, awesome. I get to stay in the comfortable car, right? With the car running. So I'm sitting in the car. And one of the first things we did, we had Mike coming down the runway doing, uh, I think it's called the scissors, where he's just kind of going back and forth with the airplane, almost like a manji and drifting. And he timed it so that he, when he got to the car, he just <laughs> flies around the car. And dude, 
again, as an airplane buff, let me tell you, he was getting so close that I could, I could hear the prop cutting through the air, like tearing the air, just as he'd go by me. It was so freaking cool. And in fact, I was down low in the seat and I turned the mirrors so that I could see him coming, right? So that you couldn't see my head in the shot. So we do that shot. It was awesome. I turned the car facing dead straight into the camera. So camera crew's in front of me. My car's facing dead straight. I'm hunkered down. I've turned the mirrors and now he's coming up behind me at 200, 250 knots. I mean, he's on it, but you can't see him. You just see the car and he's, you know, off, just off the runway. And at the last second, he pulls straight up and reveals the Audi logo on the wings. Super badass idea of a shot. So he comes and does it and the, as soon as he pulls up, the ground effect just shakes the car and I'm just giggling like a little girl in the car. It's the coolest day ever at work. And Rick's like, that was awesome. Can you get a little closer? And I'm like, oh, shit. it was already, it already felt like he was on top of me, but all right, whatever. He's going to get closer. So I'm hunkered down. I've got the mirror turned. Just like that natural instinct you do when you flinch, when something's close. At the last, you know, last second, I'm looking in the mirror. I'm seeing the, you know, the spinner on the prop and he pulls up. So at the moment, I just remember hearing the biggest explosion of all time. And look, grew up racing motorcycles and cars. You're, if you're racing professionally, you're going to crash stuff. I was to say, put it nicely. Um, and I've crashed stuff. This was the biggest accident. It felt like the biggest accident I'd ever been in. Massive explosion. And I just remember going, like I'd already kind of like flinched and closed my eyes and then wow, this explosion. And I remember thinking, oh shit. And, and I'm not sure what's going on. And I open my eyes and I just see clouds. And, then, and the thought again, when I replayed it back was, fuck, I died, I'm dead. Th this is what it's like to be dead. And I, I can't hear anything. I just see these clouds and I'm like, oh. and my mind's going, wait a minute, how did I die? What, ha how? And then all of a sudden the clouds start dissipating and I start to see windshield and I'm looking out and, and it doesn't compute. And I'm like, wait, what? And I can't hear anything. It still feels like I'm in this other state. And then all of a sudden I hear, Wee! my ears are ringing. Like all of a sudden it just came on and now it hurts. And I'm like, and I'm still piecing it together. I'm like, what is going on? And I'm looking around and I have no clue what happened. And then all of a sudden I'm thinking the concussion from the air blast, the ground effect, must have triggered an airbag maybe yeah that's what the smoke must be and as i'm sitting here trying to figure out what the hell just happened to me i see movement here and i look and it's my director rick and he's going and I'm, i can't because i can't hear anything right and he's basically saying, are you okay are you okay and all of a sudden i kind of start to hear him a little bit my hearing starts to come back but the ringing is still happening my head is throbbing and i hear the radio and i look down i pick up the radio and it's mike on the radio going is emil okay is the driver okay is emil okay is the driver okay and i'm like wait what? I look in front, the camera, some of the camera crew are there, the camera's still standing and I'm still, I, can't, I have no idea what the hell happened. I, and then my arm starts to hurt and I'm, I look down and I've got a little bit of blood in my arm. I'm like, what the? I get out of the car. I realize all the airbags have deployed. Here's what happened. We're doing the shot. He's getting a little closer. He pulls up and for whatever reason, I mean, this is a, a massively accomplished pilot. It would be like hiring Mario Andretti to do drive-bys in a car and he accidentally you know, he hits you with the wing mirror, with the, with the rear view mirror. As he pulled up, the left wing dipped just a little bit and the gear, you know, it's got fixed gear, the landing gear strut, aluminum strut, and then the gear with a carbon fiber fairing. The gear hit the back of the car at the C pillar. Now, you and I both know the strongest part structurally of a car is the base of the C pillar because of rollovers. He hit so hard at, toward the top of the C pillar that it buckled the base of the C pillar. Now, what was amazing to me and what I couldn't comprehend at the time was how the hell is he still flying this little lightweight airplane? The car had no idea what happened. The car was running in park with a, a slob sitting in the driver's seat. It recognized someone was sitting there, but because of the impact and the forces it felt, it deployed every airbag. It just said, I have no idea what's going on. I'm dropping everything. All four windows were just instantly opened a, a little bit to help dissipate the blast of, from the airbags, right? The rocket engines or rocket propellant. That was cool in, in of, and of itself. So I get out of the car, I look at the car, and I'm like, I still can't believe it. I look up and I see the airplane flying and I'm like, okay, so he must have massive damage. The freaking airplane landed and taxied perfectly fine. The only thing that happened to the airplane, a piece of carbon fiber off the fairing from the left gear, um, about the size of the palm of my hand broke off. That was it, the airplane taxied true, whatever else. But Mike obviously was shaken. I mean, I was shitting myself but he was pretty shaken up. Uh, came over just to make sure that everybody was fine. That's what he was shaken about, nothing else. But 
I heard that because we had two people closing the runway. It's a small airport, and this guy's a god in this airport anyway. He's a god in the air aviation community anyhow. But um, I think that the people that were um, managing the runway were persuaded to forget what might have happened, I'll say. I was closest to our studio on my drive home to San Diego, and so they gave me the drive with all the footage, and footage that we're not gonna use and we're not gonna ever show any of this, right? And so I remember driving home, and it's now like three in the morning because of all the BS that happened, and the airport was in the middle of nowhere, and I'm passing the studio. I stop in the studio, and I go to put the drive in the safe, and I thought, wait, we're not ever gonna see this footage? My ass. <laughs> I went to my computer, plugged in the drive, and watch the footage because I wanted to see the impact. And essentially the gears like this, when he hit, it deflected about three or four feet on the aluminum strut. And you, I, the airplane was out of frame by the time it came back, but obviously it came right back and, and was fine. And he was so close. It was so amazing. First, we got in a ton of trouble uh, from Audi. It was a media, a press car from Audi. We weren't clear to really do that with it. We may have said we we're gonna shoot with an airplane. We didn't say we we're gonna shoot with a flying airplane. They might've frowned down upon that. So we got in trouble. We got in hot water with Audi. Our boss at On Cars was not pleased with us at all. I thought I was about to lose my dream job. Um, and we heard about it the next day. Uh, to his credit, Mike Mangold wanted to buy the car, to buy the footage. And we were never gonna release that footage anyway, but I'm talking to him at, in, the, in the end of the night and I'm still like trying to comprehend what happened. I go, Mike, explain this to me. How does an airplane hit a car and it keeps flying? And you know, he's like, you know, uh, mass times speed that you know he's trying to explain force to me right like oh should have stepped, paid more attention in physics but um he felt really badly even though all things considered it worked out okay right nobody was hurt but he had an aero l29 delphine i want to say it's a soviet era czechoslovakian built jet trainer um, that he had double more than doubled the thrust on so i guess him, he and another pilot had developed this version of it called the Viper, and that's what he had. And he's like, look, anytime you want, come up, we'll go for a ride in the L-29, which as an aviation geek, are you, I get to go up in a fighter? Hell yes, or in a jet trainer. I never got around to doing that, and tragically, and so I remember being so sad and so moved reading the paper several years later that in that airplane, in the L-29, he was giving somebody a ride, Apple Valley Airport, had an engine failure, I believe it was, on takeoff, and they crashed, and they both passed away. Same exact runway that we were shooting at, so just a tragic loss. And the guy, the guy could not have been, firstly, I don't need to tell you about his accomplishments. You can look him up. He was a superstar badass, but could not have been kinder and, and more pro about how he handled the whole thing with us. So to hear that that's how it ended was, was sad. I do wish I would have gotten a ride in that jet. That would have been incredible. I think I missed an opportunity to go up in a cool airplane and do some cool stuff, but that's a story, man. That's, that's one. Again, if I didn't have photos, to, cause who's going to believe that you got hit by an airplane and you lived. Yeah. Right. True story. So at this point, if I lift off the throttle, I'm spinning. I want to say this as a public service announcement more than anything else, because there is a way to handle the, the getting pulled over. Firstly, when we get pulled over, we probably deserve it. Right. But I'll tell you, I have, and it's, it's I don't, I hesitate in saying this cause I, I don't want to jinx myself, but I have a knack for getting out of tickets. And I've got a couple of friends who are lucky charms in that regard. But in general, you have to just show respect to the officer. I mean, think about it from their perspective. They have no idea who they just pulled over. And as they're walking up, they don't know what's going to happen. It could be a parolee that doesn't want to go back to jail. It could be whatever. And so the more you show these folks respect, the more likely it is that you're going to get out of a ticket. At the end of the day, do they really want to write a ticket for somebody who is speeding a bit? I don't know if you're going to be a dick, they probably do. If you're going to be cool, you'll probably get out of it. So this is what you do folks. And I'm not saying this as like, oh, this is how you beat the system. This is how you show these guys respect. When I get pulled over, first thing I do is shut the car off. All the windows come down, all the interior lights come on. Car gets shut off. As I said, the keys are on top of the dashboard where they're clearly visible to, to the police officer and both of my hands go right to the top of the wheel. We know when you drive there at nine and three, right? But when you're getting pulled over, they're right up here. Officer comes up to the window. I apologize when he asked me, do you know what you got pulled over for? Whatever it might be. I said, you know what? I think it might've been that I might've been speeding or whatever the case might be. Just be honest. They, they know that you were speeding. And then when you're asked for your license and registration, I always say my registration is in the glove box. My license is in my pocket. Do you mind if I reach for it? 
The second you say that, they realize A, that you have respect for their job and you know that it's a tricky thing to do. B, that you're probably in law enforcement or you know somebody in law enforcement, so they're curious. And that's usually the question I get back. Not always, but sometimes I'll be like, are you in law enforcement? You have family in law enforcement? For me, that opens the door to say, no, sir, but you know, I, I do work with some special forces on drive, driver training and da-da-da-da. It's almost like there's a kinship there, like you're, you're helping our kind kind of a thing. Um, so just be respectful. And, and if you don't have warrants for your arrest and you weren't being a complete idiot on the road, you're probably going to get out of a ticket. So one of my lucky charms is one of my best friends and my college roommate, a guy named Franz von Holzhausen, who is chief designer at Tesla, one of Elon's right-hand guys. The guy, by the way, has never drawn an ugly car in his life. Model X may be accepted, but super talented car designer, ridiculous. One of the most talented guys to graduate from Art Center. So I've gotten pulled over a lot with Franz. When we were roommates at Art Center, we'd get stopped a lot because while I was studying car design at school, I was also racing, as I mentioned earlier, going through the Jim Russell Racing School program, and I had a five liter Mustang that was all tuned up. Late at night, after finishing a project at two or three in the morning, I would get in my car and I'd go to the hills of Pasadena. Again, don't do that, please. And I would go practice, which I know is like the dumbest thing on the planet, but that's what I would do. I didn't have the money to, to afford a, a test day. I had the season for free, but no test days for free, right? When I won the graduate runoff. So I would go practice in the hills in the middle of the night when nobody was out. So one early morning, I'm coming back 3 a.m. or so into my apartment and Franz is there with another friend of ours, Dan, and they've just got back from the local pool hall and they're hammered. I just finished my project. I'm sober. I was out driving, obviously. And I walk in, they're like, what were you doing? And I said, I'm just running my route. And I had a route and running my route in the hills. Let's go back out. You got to take us out. So I guess my better judgment, what am I going to do? We go back out, we're racing around and I'll never forget this. We're now coming back from the route, which is up in the hills and we're downtown and I'm still feeling the adrenaline going, which is bad move. And I come into an intersection and I'm I'm already sliding sideways as I come in. I've already set the car up and I come into the intersection completely sideways. And as I enter the intersection, there's a cop sitting right there. So at this point, if I lift off the throttle, I'm spinning mid intersection. So I'm, I'm committed, man. I'm full wah, smoke billowing off the wheel wells. And as soon as I gather the car back up and go past them on the brakes and pull over, shut the car off lights on, you know, the drill windows down, heads up on top of the wheel, but I've got two drunks in the car with me. Keep that in mind. Cop does a U-turn and pulls up right behind me, sits there for a long, uncomfortable amount of time, gets out, walks up to the car with his hand very much on his holster because he just saw some idiot come around the intersection sideways and walks up, starts giving me what I deserve, basically. Son, what do you think you're doing? Da, 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 this and that. Has a step out of the car and uh, asked me what I was doing. I said, honestly, sir, I'm out with my friends. I, they asked me to give them a ride. We just finished a project. I'm an art center student and every, all the cops in Pasadena knew that we had weird hours there. And I said, a good song came on and I just, we're on, <laughs> we were rocking out. And he starts laughing. He goes, you're going with the good song defense, huh? And I, I just sat there and looked back at him. He checked my license, made sure I didn't have any warrants. Let me go. Amazing. So I have two more Franz stories. Another one is another late night. I go off and uh, it was raining. One of these rare years when it rains in, rains in Southern California. My Mustang was always on ball tires because I couldn't afford uh, to put tires on it. Barely afford Art Center. I'm out practicing because it's the best time. It's two again, two or three in the morning. And uh, I come home and we lived in this, this building that was in a, in a block at Art Center. And as I come up on our building, I happen to catch the green light. And I knew that if you caught the first green light, you could catch them all around the block. So it's raining, it's, it's wet outside. I'm on ball tires. And so I, I decided to slide through the intersection and I timed it just right. So when I got to the next block, the next corner, it's green. And so I was basically doing, I was drifting the entire block and never, never coming out of the drift. It was so much fun. So I did probably two laps came in and parked in our underground garage and walk into our apartment and I'm just giggling to myself and Franz is awake. He was sober this time working on a project and he goes, what are you doing? I'm like, dude. And so I describe it. I was just sliding. Come on, let's go back out. And I'm like, hell yeah, let's go back out. So we go out there and sure enough, I get him in the car and I'm thinking I'm going to link the whole block and, no, and we'll be done. I'm nearly, I've nearly linked the entire block and I spin right before the last one. I'm like, son of a bitch. And he starts laughing, starts giving me shit. So I'm like, okay, let me try again. I go again, I spin again, I go again, I spin again. So now I'm like, I got my game face on, I'm gonna put it together. And sure enough, I'm putting it together. I come around the last one and it, all of a sudden, it was like Christmas. Policemen from every, it was like a movie. There's no way they could have come from every direction. It's, it's almost like they planned it and we're around and all of a sudden it's like action and they all moved in. 
I was sliding sideways and I see police lights in the mirror. I'm like, oh God, oh God. And so I, I correct and I pull over right away and they came from everywhere and surround us. Both of us out of the car, walk backwards. So they separate us trying to get our stories uh, straight. Believe it or not, didn't get a ticket. And I remember the first cop came up and he's like, son, do you think this is your personal racetrack? We've gotten calls. You've been out here for 20 minutes. It was probably, actually probably 20 minutes, but just dumb. What are you doing? And it was a loud car. It's just stupid, but I got away with it. That was awesome. And my last <laughs> Franz is my lucky charm story. Once a year, the car designer community in Southern California get together at one of the studios. Typically, I don't know if this is happening actually lately. They do have like a cars and coffee, but it's all car designers and you bring your, your cool car. Car designers tend to be working on cool, sometimes funky things. So this same Mustang that I drove to Art Center, when I first made some money in my life, I turned it into just this ridiculous thing. It was in all it was in Super Ford magazine, Fast Ford magazines. It was insane. It was built by Griggs Racing. What started the whole project, my sponsor in racing, John Haysport, who raced for Roush Racing, I got a birthday present for you. You can have 500 horsepower for free, or you can have 700 horsepower for $5,000. I'm a starving student. I'm like, I like 500 horsepower for a free 99. Two weeks later, I get a crate engine from Roush, a development engine from Roush Racing, 351. Built, this is before Roush was making street cars, right? So I have this Roush, Roush motor. My Mustang had been parked at a friend's desert sort of graveyard for a couple of years. It was a rat trap, but that started it. So I restored it, Greek Racing up in Sears Point Raceway, built the car. It was basically kind of like a world challenge spec car, but street legal, still had Florida plates on it. It was a beast, put it that way, 2,900 pounds. It ended up nearly 600 horsepower, Tremec six speed, big bare brakes, carbon fiber, everything. And so I'm at this car show with my car. Franz is there, he was director of design at Mazda. This is just before he went to Tesla. He goes, dude, for old time's sakes, you gotta take me for a ride. And we used to call my car the boss. You gotta take me for a ride in the boss. So we go out and I take him for a ride. And this Mazda's headquarters, design headquarters on a, a street in Irvine called Red Hill. And Red Hill's two or three lanes on either side, big open avenue. And the intersection before is another big open avenue. So we're coming down the, the street adjacent to Red Hill. And at probably 60 or 70 miles an hour, I pitch a thing sideways and I come into Red, because I know everybody's standing out there because they hear the car coming, right? Show off. And I come into the intersection completely sideways. Rah! And I fly past the building at Red Hill where everybody's standing at a speed I shouldn't say and I won't say, but flying. Like the sound barrier probably was heard. And as I do that, I look in the mirror and as soon as I look in the mirror, I see like the roof number on the, the on, on a police car because the guy's on his brake so hard. So this guy, when we came through the intersection, saw us, turned his lights on, ran the light to get behind us. And so as soon as I flew past the crowd, I lifted off the throttle, I start slowing down, I look in the mirror and I see the guy slowing up behind me. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to jail. There's, n there's no way I'm getting out of this one. So I instantly turn on my turn signal pull over, go down the street and pull over on the side. Cop comes up and it was that typical, you think this is your personal racetrack? I've gotten that a lot. Comes up and what the hell do you think you're doing? Thinks you're your personal racetrack? And I say, sir, I'm so sorry. I'm here with a, my college friend. I haven't seen him in a long time. I just finished building my car. There's a car show up the street. And he's like, car show? And so I proceed to tell him about this car show. A bunch of car designers are there, this and that. And he was a super car geek. And he goes, I tell you what, I'm gonna go back to the car. I'm gonna check and make sure you don't have any warrants. If you don't, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna follow you back to this car show. And as he's walking away, Franz is like, no fucking way, no way. You just got out of the ticket. Sure enough, the cop came back. He gave me my license back. He goes, I'm gonna follow you back at the speed limit. And he starts to walk away from my car and he turns around and comes back and he goes, by the way, that car sounded awesome. Who gets that lucky? This guy right here, amazing, amazing. Respect law enforcement, don't do stupid shit. And he's turned to me and his eyes are as big as saucers. And he goes, I have your car. Monterey Car Week. Mecca for any car guy or gal. I'm lucky enough to work it for a number, over the last 10 years I've been there. Used to work it a lot for um, an Italian manufacturer, which makes red cars. I'm sorry, it's like I can't say the name because I don't want to get in trouble. And this year, actually, I, I led, was lucky enough to lead a rally from Southern California up to Monterey. Took three or four days, I think it was, a pack of these red cars. It was amazing. Staying at cool venues. I was the compare, they call it, the MC. And so I got to talk at breakfast and lunch. And there were some awards, best photo, best this, best that. Amazing. But I got up there and changed shirts and put on my Audi shirt. For the last two years now, I've been working for Audi during Monterey Car Weeks because I used to work for that Italian manufacturer. 
But I got a call from Audi saying, hey, look, we're trying to put together a track event during Monterey Historics, during the, the Historics Racing Weekend at Laguna Seca. Would you be interested in leading it for us? The answer is always yes, especially when it's on track, right? But I remember saying yes, thinking there's no way these guys are going to get track time at Laguna Seca during the Historics Weekend or the Pebble Beach Weekend because it's so, so much is going on. Anybody that's been there knows that that is nonstop. The track is used. You know, they, they've got pre-war cars. They've got post-war, early cars, under two liter, over two liter. It's a very, very busy weekend. I, I don't know that I've seen a busier weekend on track at Laguna Seca than the Monterey Historics. So I said yes, thinking I'm still going to be wearing a red shirt in Monterey. But how Audi secured track time, what we do, we do um, like a mini Audi sports car experience where you get to come out and do a lead follow in an R8, followed by some hot laps from us. And it's a, it's a cool program, but they got track time because we get the very first slot in the morning. So the first session is oh dark early, and then we have the last spot in the day. The beauty for us, myself and one of my best friends works the program with me, super accomplished driver, former pro drive rally guy. I mean, badass and one of the nicest human beings ever. I won't mention his name because he hates publicity. We work it together. So I'm working with one of my best friends. There's a lot of downtime from that first morning session to that last even, early evening session. And we're there hobnobbing and shaking hands and talking about Audis and walking around and stuff. But there's time where we get to go take a break. My friend decided, hey, let's go preview some of the cars up for auction. You know, all the auction houses are there. I don't know which ones are there, but I know RM Sotheby's was there. And that's uh, it, last year's when they sold that GTO for 48 million, I want to say something ridiculous. And a lot of people don't know, you can go pay $30 and you get to preview all the cars. And the cars, it's so funny, it seemed like the cars that are 10 million above are in, indoors. And then the, you know, the lowly sub $10 million cars are all outdoors. So we go and I say that many people must not know about it because this is the middle of the day and there weren't many people previewing the car. I mean, we walked right up to that GTO and we we're looking at it. The, uh, the McLaren F1 that had been converted to an LM spec, <gasps> white, amazing. And the guy that was the, the car's curator and the guy that was that actually sold the car could not have been nicer. I mean, we were there in our Audi uniform, so he could tell that we we're kind of official to us, but he didn't know us from Adam. He let us behind the rope. We sat in the car. I mean, that thing's amazing. It quickly moved to, I think, third on my all-time favorite cars list behind a couple of red cars. But it was amazing. So we looked at all the cars inside. Then we go outside and we're looking at some cars. So it was a 250 TDF that was outside. That shows you the level of the cars that were inside some Jaguar E-Types, 300 SLs. We're looking at all these cars, a big block Corvette. And then we get to an LFA. Now my friend who's a super experienced guy had never been in an LFA, didn't know too much about the LFA. And I was lucky enough to be one of the guys working the program when Lexus launched that car in the US. We launched it at Sears Point Raceway or Sonoma Raceway, whatever they call it nowadays. It was an extensive walk around we do of the car. The car would be up on a lift. Uh, we'd give hot laughs. We'd, we'd do a zero to 150 mile an hour to zero run where we were driving. The participants were with us. And these people were folks that had one on order and were going to get one. So they were dealership principals, right? Lexus dealership owners from around the country, really premium, really great program where we got a lot of seat time. They got a lot of seat time. And, um, I remember leaving that program feeling like, first of all, loving that car. The gearbox is a bit of a letdown. Yes. Single clutch electro hydraulic box. It's a little clunky. But the rest of the car feels like Toyota poured their might into the car. I mean, it's that impressive. One of the nicest supercar interiors you'll ever see. The noise, it's like that thing in a Courier GT are arguably the best sounding cars of all time. And it's funny, I consider myself a V12 guy. Those are both V10 cars I just mentioned. So I guess I'm a V10 guy, but amazing car. So I'm there with my buddy and we're, we start talking about LFA. He's like, oh, so tell me a little bit about what you remember from the program. So I'm telling him about it. We're sitting in it. We get out, pop the hood. We're looking at that Yamaha V10. Um, the little sound tubes that go into the cabin, just, it's just a piece of art, that car. And as we're under hood, this guy walks up, no one else around. This guy walks up and he goes, Hey, listen, I'm totally unsolicited by the way. Hey, listen, I'm a big Ferrari guy, but I got to tell you that car's pretty awesome. So we both poke, poke our heads out from under the hood and my friend starts laughing and he goes, that's funny. That's what he would say pointing at me. Cause that's a line that I would probably deliver about that car. Right? So, uh, the guy's probably early 60s, really nice guy. We start chatting and we're talking about the car. I'm like, oh, you know a little bit about this car. He goes, oh yeah, I've got three of them. I'm like, okay, I got none of them, but I've driven like five of them, all right? How do you like me now? Super nice guy, very knowledgeable, uh, knows his Ferraris clearly. And uh, all of a sudden we're five minutes into chatting and I look up and he's wearing a hat, says uh, 2000 GT. And I go, it's funny, is that a Toyota 2000 GT hat? And he goes, oh, you know the 2000 GT? I go, yeah, I know the car. In fact, I was just telling my buddy here, this LFA is really the spiritual successor to the Toyota 2000 GT. He goes, oh, you do know the car. And I go, I do know the car. My, my father had one. I grew up in one. And he's like, 
your dad had one. I have nine of them. And they're like a million, a million and a half, I think, in current value. So we start talking. I go, yeah, I'll show you some photos. I, that's, that car like started me on this journey. And like my earliest childhood memories were being in that car with my dad in Puerto Rico. And, you know, no baby seats back then. I'm a little toddler sitting in the, pa- probably standing in the passenger seat. And we're sitting at a light. And my earliest memory, I kid you not, my earliest memory in my life was my dad pointing at a, at a car parked in a corner. It was a Jaguar E-Type, a white E-Type series one I'll never forget. And then telling me how the Toyota would fare up against the E-Type because this Toyota was first Japanese supercar. It was comparable to an E-Type or a Corvette of, of its day. So I'm looking for the photos. He's like, wow, that's so cool your dad had one. As I'm looking through my phone, he's looking through his phone to find a photo of all nine of them lined up. Or he said something about, oh, it's funny that your dad had one. I go, yeah, it was the only one on the island of Puerto Rico. As I say this, I see movement and I look up at him and he's turned to me and his eyes are as big as saucers. And he goes, I have your car. Okay. I dude, I'm getting chills right now. Just telling you that story. And I normally tear up when I tell the story. It's been a while since I've told it. Again, my friend that's working with me is one of my best friends. And he at the time was getting teary eyed too, as, as we all, the three of us were. And I'm like, what do you mean you have my car? And he goes, I have your family's car. I bought it from your family. Turns out he bought it from the family that my dad sold it to, which owned a lot of the, um, the rights for importing, you know, nice cars like that. A family that's still around in Puerto Rico. I think they're called the Gomez family. And so I said, actually, that wasn't my family. My dad sold it back to the dealership because, oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that because they had painted the car yellow. And I looked up, originally it was red car and I've restored it back to original condition. And, I'm, and he goes, and I'm blown away. So I show him the photo of me in the little electric car and he goes, do me a favor, zoom in on the plate. So I zoom in on the license plate. He goes, I still have the original plate. So he has my dad's car and, I, and I'm telling him, I'm like, you don't understand. This, this car started me on this lifelong journey to, to follow this passion, start creating this passion I have for cars that has been my life. I became a racing driver because of that car. I became a car designer because of that car. I, my life is cars partially, yes, because of my dad, but because of my, the connection with my dad and this car. And so I'm telling him this and the guy's tearing up. As we're having this discussion, a gentleman walks up who was the, the number one car in that rally that I led for that Italian supercar maker. And he goes, hey, Emil, how are you? And this guy, the, the Toyota 2000 GT guy, I don't want to mention any names, turns to the other guy and says, you know Emil? He goes, yeah, Emil just led this rally up from Southern California with us. He's a great guy. He's the lead instructor for this manufacturer and that manufacturer. And so the guy's like, what? And so he's now getting a little bit of my credentials, not because I'm not out there bragging about you know, what I do or whatever. And the guy turns to me and goes, where do you live? And I go, Southern California. He goes, listen, I live in Florida. You have to promise me you will fly out to Florida. I will rent out Moroso, the uh, Palm Beach International Raceway, and I want you to drive your dad's car. And I don't want you to drive it. I want you to drive it, drive it. I've never driven a Toyota 2000 GT. Most people watching have never driven a Toyota GT. Most people haven't seen a Toyota 2000 GT. And this guy's inviting me to come out and drive his car. And he goes, and if it's okay with you, we'll bring out two of the Nürburgring package LFAs and maybe we do a little coaching one-on-one. I'm thinking, what? I'm going to get to go. So the bummer in this is that this happened in August, obviously, and, and we have been missing each other. We haven't been able to connect to drive the car. I was hoping that I would have already driven the car to come up here and tell you the full story and show you video of me driving it because my friend volunteered to fly himself down, pick me up, fly down to South Florida, and just play videographer because he wants to be there to see this moment where I'm reunited with the car that, that started it all for me. The one and only 2000 GT in Puerto Rico. And it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. I finally connected with the guy and I think we're going to try to do it during uh, Amelia Island weekend or thereabouts. So how cool is that? The car that got me started. I can't wait. We realized pretty quickly that our R8s were not fast enough to stay ahead of the participants station wagons. So another company that I get to work for a ton, um, and really the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart is Audi. Um, I told you before I was the first chief instructor of the Audi sports car experience. And when I left to host a show at On Cars, that relationship stayed alive, thankfully. And, and while I was the host of On Cars, I still got to do some Audi programs. I did a program in uh, Central and South America called an Audi sports car experience, Latino America. And it was six countries in three months. And it was an amazing experience. But a couple of the coolest ones that we got to do for Audi, we got to do uh, an Audi sports car experience in Malaysia, in Sepang, at the Formula One track. We had the instructor, it was two of us instructors, myself, myself and one of my best friends. 
and the participants were all in RS6 Avants and it was the V10 twin turbo RS6, which is amazing. And it's so cool on those programs, the best time for us instructors are always the setup days because we have all the cars and we have the track and we have to go set up our courses and, and drive the track to make sure that it's all perfect, right? So we're just out there horsing around once we get our, all our work done. So that was amazing. But the neatest thing about the program itself is that, you know, we're leading the, the group with R8s, which is not a slouch, just low cart. They were right-hand drive, which is a little bit weird initially to get used to, but Sepang has really long straights. If anybody who's watched a Formula One race knows that. And uh, we realized pretty quickly that our R8s were not fast enough to stay ahead of the participants' station wagons, RS6s. And so we'd come out of the hairpin that leads onto the long front straight, and I'd try to get the biggest run I possibly could on the group, you know, put any talent that I still have left to get a good run out of the corner. And I'd gap them pretty solidly. And by the end of the straightaway, the entire pack of RS6s would be on my butt having to come off the throttle. It's just cool to think of a wagon being that fast. The last day of that program, coincidentally, some journalists came out and so the folks at Audi of Malaysia gave him my lead R8 and gave me an RS4 convertible right-hand drive. I was not happy. Firstly, it's now a manual shift and I've got a walkie-talkie and I'm in the right seat and it's a convertible, so it's a waste of an RS engine as far as I'm concerned. So I was really busy that day. It didn't help that I had, um, I don't know what you would call the Malaysian version of Montezuma's Revenge, but I was not a happy guy working hard in that RS4. But the other cool program that I got to do with Audi was they sent two of us, myself and one of my best friends in the world, Stefan Verdier, to uh, Singapore during the Grand Prix weekend to launch the R8 V10 in Singapore. When we were briefed on the project, they, they were very keen on the fact that this was not called an R8 V10, it was an R8 5.2. And that's how we were ref to refer to it, R8 5.2. And the conversations on the conference calls, we'd say, yeah, that, because we had our eight V8s there as well as comparisons. And so we would just be just talking in context about the cars and say V10. And they, Remember, it's R8 5.2. Fast forward to us being there and all the signage and everything there, R8 V10. It was just kind of one of those funny things. But that program was cool because, again, it was Grand Prix weekend. So we got to give laps before the start of the Grand Prix in the car. And then at the start of the Grand Prix, they craned one of the, v, one of the R8 5.2s to the top of the, um, I want to say it was the Fullerton Hotel, the, some, one of the hotels that overlooks the track. And the top floor of the hotel was shared between Chopard Watches and Audi. We were like rock stars that weekend. It was so cool to be up there and looking down at the, at the Formula One circuit at night. And that night turned into a pretty epic night for a bunch of crazy reasons that I am not at liberty to discuss. But it was neat to just feel like, you know, we had a driver that chauffeured us to the home that they had rented for us. And, you know, we we're giving laps on, on, we were just, we were rock stars that weekend. And then Stefan and I fly back to LA where LAX just get out of customs and we're sitting there waiting for our bags and waiting for our bags and waiting for our bags. And I'll never forget, he turns to me, he's like, welcome back to reality. We're nobody again. So anyway, that was, that was a cool program. And then the other company that I do uh, currently do some work for is Tesla. Again, I have a great relationship with them due to my college roommate and one of my dear friends, Franz von Holzhausen, being the chief designer there and Elon's right-hand guy. And I got to work a little bit on Model S. Not as a, dev I, you know, everybody, oh, you got to do some development work. I have such respect for development engineers and what they do and what, how sensitive those guys are to changes that I can't say that. I, I was basically there to give my opinion on the car. Franz knew that I get to drive a lot of cool cars and, and new leading edge cars for a lot of manufacturers. And so they wanted my opinion on ride and handling and stability control, traction control. And I'll never forget, so I get there, the chief development engineer at Tesla at the time was a gentleman named Graham Sutherland from Lotus, ex-Lotus. And, and Lotus is known as sort of like the breeding ground for great development engineers, super knowledgeable guy. They also had a, a, general, a guy there, a young guy, Aaron Bailey, accomplished racing driver, great guy, development engineer. And so they, I get up there and I'm you know, there on Franz's recommendation and we go out in a development mule, Model S development mule, and I drive it through the hills with these two guys that I know know their shit in the car with me. And they're asking me questions, what I think, and this and about the steering and the ride and blah, blah, blah. And so we get back to the development headquarters there in Palo Alto. We park the car, we go off to lunch and Graham talks to a couple of the mechanics and has them change some things so that when we come back to lunch, I'll drive it and assess the differences. Get back to lunch, get in the car, and we're out driving. They change some shims in the suspension. Not like springs and shocks, they change washers basically, right? So I'm out in the same hills driving the car and they're both looking at me like, you feel it? You feel it? And as much as every part of me wanted to say, yes, I feel, I didn't feel a damn difference. And it's amazing to me how these guys can feel like the slightest changes. And so 
I had to be honest and say I didn't, I didn't feel anything, but that was my first foray into working with Tesla since I got a call to work with them on the new Tesla Roadster. So the, if you saw any of the launch videos of that car, I was the guy giving the rides a zero to 80 mile, a zero to whatever mile an hour rides the entire night. We were supposed to originally give rides for about two hours and we ended up giving rides to about 1.30 in the morning. And I can't say very much about that car at all because I've already gotten in trouble for an Instagram post that I put up. I literally put up uh, during testing, we were doing acceleration runs and the car had been launched. This is like a week after the launch event. Tesla has released all the photos to the media, including a video showing the car accelerating from the standstill to whatever mile an hour. And I had a video that one of the Tesla employees had shared with me that showed basically the same thing. Me in the car going from zero to whatever miles an hour. And I put up on Instagram with something just saying, yeah, you know, this car got launched, whatever. And within minutes, I got to call the police, take it down. So I know I can't say much about that car. What I will say about it is that I know there's some skepticism about the figures that Elon quoted that day, 060, 100, quarter mile. And I think I can say without getting in trouble that those are actual figures. Those aren't theoreticals. Those aren't calculations. We've done those numbers. And I probably shouldn't say that those numbers are even conservative, but they are. That thing is going to be a proper weapon. So I know there's lots of skeptics. I know people say, oh, yeah, but I'll be dead before it comes out. I don't know. I have faith. I, I love that I live in a world where all these cars exist. You know, you have Koenigseggs and Paganis and Ferraris and Lamborghinis and McLarens and Porsches and Remax and Teslas. So I know there's a lot of hate out there, but I just don't understand. If you're a car person, wouldn't you root for everybody? And so not because I'm working for them, partially because I'm working for them, but not just because that. I'm definitely rooting for them because the world will be a better place if that car does get built and it gets on the road because other people are going to build cars to beat it and we're going to win. So I see the sheriff and I lift off the throttle and look down. We we're going 181 miles an hour. I have to preface this whole thing by saying I am not condoning speeding on the road. The stories I'm about to tell you were either in closed road conditions or a thousand years ago when I was young and dumb. And, and honestly, and, and seriously for a second, it was back in my youth speeding in the eighties, early nineties. Yes, you'd get in trouble. You could go to jail. It was a big deal. But nowadays, if you get pulled over for speeding, let's say you're on the road messing around with somebody and somebody writes down both of your license plates and that person later on, you're done. That person later on gets in an accident and God forbid hurt somebody. And somebody had written your plates down and you get reported as you were street racing with that person. That is potentially, that's homicide. That's involuntary homicide. It's a big deal to race today. So do not do silly things on the road like I'm about to describe. The most recent was in closed road conditions. We're shooting on in Manhattan, Fifth Avenue. So camera cars there, you drop back a bit, you fly by 75, 80 miles an hour, what have you. Then we started doing some where I would come from an adjacent street and slide into view and pass camera. But on one of them, we had the road closed and a police officer was at the end of the road with his radar gun out. I'd seen it. Anytime you see a police officer when you, where you have a closed road deal and you see him with his radar gun out, to me, that's a challenge. It's like, oh, is that just a set? this is how it's going to be? All right, then. And here I come onto the street and I'm hammered down and I'm getting after it coming out the camera car. And typically, as soon as you're, you know that you're out of frame, even before the director yells cut, you're off the throttle slowing down because what's the point? Uh, but this time I did on a little bit longer knowing that the radar gun was out. And sure enough, toward the end of the day, I find the police officer that was there working with us who actually wasn't that helpful during the shoot, by the way. Uh, although New York City Police was generally amazing to work with NYPD. So he had his gun out. So I went up to him I'm like, oh, I saw that you had your radar gun and you were shooting a bit. He's like, yeah. And, and he was like, he knows exactly why I'm asking him. Like, are you really going to make me pull that out of you? I'm like, so what was it? And he goes, it was pretty quick. In fact, I, it's a speed record. And I'm like, what do you mean a speed record? And he goes, well, the fastest speed we've recorded in Manhattan, which I still to this day think is BS because 147 miles an hour on Fifth Avenue. And I said, that can't be. I mean, I'm Puerto Rican. I know there's a lot of Puerto Ricans, New Yorkans in New York City riding Hayabusa's with like turbo Hayabusa's that make a million horsepower. No, for sure those guys have gone a million miles an hour in, in Manhattan. So he claims that he called it into the precinct. Now, I don't know if what particular precinct, but anyway, 147 miles an hour on Fifth Avenue, New York. St street closed down. I'll take it. Uh, my first sponsor in racing was a gentleman who was really good to me. Uh, not only did he help me go racing, but he had a collection of Ferraris at the time that he would just throw me the keys to and I could drive around an F40. This is in early nineties, an F40, a 512 TR that I got to spend a lot of time in. And I was w actually with him in the F40 coming back from Daytona beach, Florida. He lived in Orlando. We were in Daytona. We're coming back. It's the middle of the night, two or three in the morning. I'm driving and 
I start getting a little bit sporty, as he called it. And I'm speeding a bit. He turns out, he's like, relax, young man, as he used to call me. So I relax a little bit. And he starts dozing off. And wide open stretch of I-4 in Central Florida. And I thought, man, I'm not going to get an opportunity like this. So I just, you can't quietly downshift to fourth and an F-40. But I <laughs> tried to quietly downshift to fourth and F-40 and pinned it. And the thing, you know, starts accelerating. Then it comes on boost and it starts to pull hard. And I redline fourth and I grab fifth. And I'm, and I sense movement. I know he's awake and he just, he kind of leans over. I know he's looking at the speedo. He, without any communication, he knows what's up. First 200 mile an hour car, he's I'm, I'm trying to peg the speedometer. And we know that those speedometers were massively optimistic. And so I was on it right up until it creeped past 200. And then he's like, that's enough, young man. Slow it down. And I lift off the throttle. So realistically, 201 indicated in F40, 185. <laughs> 190 but screw that it said 200 i'm taking it 200 miles an hour on the road uh, the f40 i'd never be able to keep overnight so i drive it all day put it back in his garage and take the 512 tr which he was okay with me keeping that right 22 year old in a 512 tr for crying out loud i just finished giving like all the kids in the neighborhood a ride their first ride in a 512 tr pretty cool but one of my friend's wives i'd just given a ride to and we'd done like 160 something on the road again don't do this at home i was a dumbass i shouldn't have done that Get back and drop her off and my best friend gets in the car with me and we're now heading back to his house we're leaving and, I, and he goes oh how'd you fast you go i'm like dude we just did 160 whatever it was and he's that was faster than we had gone he and i had gone so he's like oh, that's bullshit. we got to go faster than that so we pull out onto this road in central florida called red bug road anybody that lives in central florida knows red bug before there were a thousand neighborhoods to either side pull out on a red bug and i start grabbing gears first second third fourth and i shift up into fifth in this car and it's that flat 12 is sorry 180 degree v12 in ferraris it's a freaking flat 12 is screaming and that sound to this day that career gt and lexus lfa best sounding cars of all time grabbing gears i'm ripping what and I, i'll never forget this and my friend steve who's in the car with me is total jackass i mean sarcastic son of a bitch and just a jackass we're flying no one on the rest see a car in the distance it's a two-lane row with a big median two lanes on the other side some neighborhoods off to the side i'm ripping wah. And I'm like, okay, I'm starting to think about breathing off the throttle because this car's coming up and we're doing 170, 180 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, when the car comes into view enough on the back of the trunk, Sheriff. Let that sink in for a second. Sheriff, Dodge Diplomat. I'll never forget that boxy piece of crap. It's so funny how a lot of thoughts go through your brain in the fraction of a second, right? So I see the Sheriff and I lift off the throttle and look down, we're 181 miles an hour indicated and I, I lift and I went right back to full power and the thought process later on I was able to rethink it was like what I'm gonna pass him at 150 on the brakes what is that right so right back down right by the and as we go by my jackass buddy reaches over neep, neep, as we fly past the cop I fly past him there was a neighborhood called deer run that's still there like a mile and a half down the way but it just appeared like that as you would imagine in 180 miles an hour and i remember knowing that deer run is coming up and i start braking and now i'm coming up on cars and the thing is slowing down but it's not slowing down like i need it to slow down and there are two cars almost side by side and you can't make this up it's like a movie we go on as hard as we can be braking on the brakes right between the two cars just barely make the turn into deer run and once you're in deer run there was like a million ways to get out and we sort of made our way through deer run and i i went back parked the car in my racing sponsor's garage early, the first time I ever showed up early, shut it off, got back in my mom's car, drove my friend home and drove home the entire time crapping my pants, waiting for the call from John, my sponsor. The police are here, what did you do? And the whole thing blew over. My friend's laughing the whole time. He thought it was the greatest thing ever. I thought it was cool like a year later, <laughs> but at the time it was scary as hell. So there are my top speed stories. I'm sure you have some of your own, but those are the ones, again, don't do this at home. Huge respect for law enforcement. Honestly, I'm not just saying that. And uh, you can't do that kind of stuff. That was when I was young and dumb. And I, I'm lucky to have gotten away with it.